Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me this afternoon. Uh, my name is Stephen Gordon. I'm a senior technical product manager at Red Hat, uh, primarily for OpenStack Compute um, and its interaction with uh, related technologies in the underlying hypervisor. Um, today, I'm going to be talking uh, specifically about uh, the features in the compute service uh, for moving instances around an OpenStack cloud, um, and primarily um, some of the differences between them from a, a user-facing point of view, and also some of the things that have been done in Liberty uh, to improve uh, these facilities, uh, and also um, some of the things planned and being discussed for Mataka at the moment. So. In terms of that, uh, I'll be focusing first on uh, defining what we're actually moving. Uh, so, you know, the spoiler alert at the bottom there is instances, uh, so compute instances we're moving around. Um, but what does that really mean in terms of the components um, of those virtual machines? Um, why we're moving them? Uh, how we're moving them? So in terms of those uh, user-facing APIs to actually initiate the moves. Um, and then also the new enhancements that are coming, um, both in the current and upcoming release. So in terms of what we're moving, uh, if we talk about our instance or our server, uh, as it's referred to in the Nova API, uh, we have our guest configuration, uh, which can be this mo the simpler or more obvious things like how many CPUs, how much RAM uh, is associated with the guest, uh, but also all the way down to the uh, device profiles that are actually exposed by the hypervisor. Um, so today, in particular, I'll be focusing largely on the libvirt slash KVM driver and the way uh, migration uh, works with it. Um, and it includes, uh, as part of the guest configuration, a lot of different things and options uh, for things like uh, the disk device drivers um, that you should be using and so on. Uh, there's also the guest storage. Uh, primarily here I'm talking about the initial image or volume from which the guest was booted. Um, and I separate that out from uh, the disk part of the guest state, so your ephemeral storage. Um, so in terms of guest state, we're talking both about the in-memory state um, of the guest, but also what's stored on that ephemeral disk. Um, all of the paths we have for moving instances around a compute deployment um, involve moving some subset of these elements, um, but which uh, mechanism you use for moving the instances, instances will vary depending on which of these elements you care about. So you may, for example, not necessarily care too much about the on-disk state for ephemeral or the in-memory state um, if you have particularly cloud-ready applications. And you may be willing to throw that away, but you just want to know that the instance is going to come back up somewhere else um, in the initial state that you had in the guest in the image. So in terms of why we're moving uh, instances, um, so in, an, in the OpenStack world at least, uh, all of the APIs I'm going to talk about uh, are marked as admin APIs um, in OpenStack parlance. Um, so that means they're not necessarily exposed to normal users, um, but they are available to the tenant administrators. Um, and that, that becomes a little bit important uh, shortly because even though they're, only ex or they're exposed at the tenant admin level, uh, it still exposes in the current form uh, back-end details to that tenant administrator that they shouldn't necessarily have to know. Um, so why might we, why, might we be uh, performing these moves? Um, so we may be doing them proactively, uh, so in, in advance of node maintenance. Uh, so that may be we're adding or removing hardware. Um, or we know, based on our monitoring tools, that there's an imminent hardware failure coming. So we might preemptively try and move our instances off of that host. Um, it may be reactive in terms of the node has already failed for some reason. It's lost power or there has been a hardware failure. And we're also, also for potentially capacity management uh, reasons. So um, in the, the way the schedule works in Nova is we basically place once, uh, and then once the instance is running somewhere, there's not really a concept of dynamic rescheduling um, in reaction to the way capacity needs may change or something like a noisy neighbor effect. Um, so the admin of the tenant may want to move instances around either to spread them out or consolidate depending on uh, what their goals are uh, with their OpenStack deployment. So getting into the meat of it and how we're moving instances. Uh, so I mentioned there are a number of different APIs in Nova for achieving uh, a similar goal. Uh, and that is, in fact, part of the reason for the confusion, uh, which I guess in, it spurred me to do this talk in the first place. Um, so even in the development community, this is little understood in terms of the API documentation around this isn't great. Um, and we've provided a number of similar things that we're exposing to the user, back-end details that they probably shouldn't have to know about how the move is actually happening. Um, so if we look in the command line help, we see that there's... Uh, seven different actions in the Nova command line client uh, that relate to moving instances. Uh, 
One of those is the list, so we kind of exclude that, but that still leaves us with six different ways we could move an instance from one host to another, uh, potentially. Um, so the, the issues with this range from minor nits, like the fact that we use uh, migration rather than migrate uh, when we're talking about the live migration, um, down to the fact that we include servers in the API call in one case but not the rest, or even in the last example, the case where we conflate live migration with evacuation, which are actually completely different things. Um, and the user looking at this doesn't necessarily know whether you're doing an evacuate or a live migration uh, when you do a host evacuate live. Um, and we'll get to that in a moment. So trying to step back a little bit, um, the primary three mechanisms are evacuate, migrate, uh, which is sometimes called cold, cold migrate uh, as a way of trying to be a little bit more specific about this, or live migration. So evacuate um, specifically rebuilds an instance that is currently on a compute node that is down on a different compute node. That distinction is important because in many ways it acts in the same way as migrate, uh, but migrate only works when the uh, source host is up. Um, it's a little bit more nuanced than that, and we'll get into that in a second, um, in that by rebuild, uh, in the migrate case, we really mean resize. Uh, so the, the migrate command is in and of itself uh, a path through to resize, which is originally designed in the Nova API for resizing an instance between two flavors. Um, and coincidentally, as part of that operation, it puts it on a different host. Uh, so migrate is abusing that functionality uh, in some ways, and it also results in some other oddities, uh, which we'll see in an example in the moment. Um, with live migration, uh, that's the case where we're moving an instance, uh, keeping all of its state, so not just the on disk state, um, but also the uh, in-memory state and trying to do it with as little downtime as possible um, to the point where that downtime should be unnoticeable to the guest operating system applications. Um, in terms of the other commands that are listed, so host evacuate, host servers migrate, and host evacuate live, these are all actually uh, helpers. Uh, and don't necessarily map one-to-one -to, -one to a Nova API call at the back end either, so some of them are actually implemented in the client. Uh, so host evacuate uh, does a rebuild of all of the instances on the specified host and puts them on a new compute node. Um, host servers migrate um, does the same with the migrate command, so again, that distinction uh, between whether we're talking about uh, a host that is down or a host that is up. And then finally, host evacuate live um, doesn't actually do an evacuation, but live migrates all of those instances on that host to a new place. So drilling down on each of these individually, uh, when we talk about evacuation, so we have the Nova evacuate command, uh, we have optional password and on-shared storage arguments, um, and then the mandatory server, so the instance name or ID that we're trying to, uh, trying to move, uh, and optionally a target host. So as I mentioned, evacuation only works when the compute node hosting the instance is down, or recognized as down by Nova, more importantly. Um, and it will rebuild the instance on a new compute node. Uh, the main, so obviously when we're doing this rebuild, the node is down. So we can't copy, for example, the in-memory state, or even if we're not using shared storage, the ephemeral disk state uh, to the new location. But there is still some benefit over just starting completely afresh, and that you do get to keep uh, the uni unique ID and the IP and a couple of other details about the instance is the same when you use this mechanism. Uh, so that's the benefit you get there. Um, if we are on shared storage, so if we specify that flag, uh, we can also get the ephemeral disk across as well. Um, the one other thing is because we are doing a rebuild, um, there is the opportunity uh, to inject a new admin user password at this point. Uh, if we don't specify one, it will be, it will be uh, randomly generated for us anyway. Um, so in the example here, uh, I'm just doing a Nova evacuate without shared storage. Uh, you can see it generates me a new password and prints that out uh, on the command line for me. Uh, the one other thing I should, should mention is um, evacuation does allow us to bypass the scheduler. So if you don't specify a target host, the scheduler is going to pick it for you, uh, which is the default behavior. Um, but if we specify a target host, we are bypassing the scheduler com completely, and that's one of the reasons this is an ad administrative API. It's not exposed to the normal user. Uh, when we talk about cold migration, um, it's a little bit different, so it doesn't have nearly as many options available, uh, and part of the reason for that is because, as I mentioned before, it's actually going through the resize API behind the scenes, 
and that resize API is actually available to normal users. So that's why, for example, it doesn't allow bypassing the scheduler, and it doesn't necessarily require you to know what storage is involved either. Um, so as I mentioned before, it only works when the compute node hosting the instance is up or still up, um, and it rebuilds uh, on a new host selected by the scheduler. Um, so that involves actually shutting down the instance, copying the disk, and then starting the instance on the new hypervisor. And after it's successfully done that, it'll also remove uh, from the original hypervisor. Um, one of the weird things about it is because we're using the resize path, uh, the resize API call has a manual confirmation step. So someone has to manually confirm um, that the resize worked uh, before the instance will go back to its normal operational state. Uh, the same applies to migrate because it's going down that path, uh, which is a little bit of an oddity um, in the current way it's implemented. So in the shared storage uh, case, uh, migrate doesn't actually know that. So it will do the copy anyway, um, which is problematic in and of itself. So one of the weird things about, um, so this is where the, uh, I guess, information that a tenant admin shouldn't necessarily have to know is filtering up through the API is that Nova is not, make, not even trying to make a determination, in these cases at least, uh, as to whether it's on shared storage or not. Um, so for that reason, that tenant admin trying to initiate this command, or not this specific command, but the others, has to know and tell it. Um, and that's one of the problems with the current implementation uh, that we've been discussing a little bit. Uh, because as a user of the cloud, obviously, you shouldn't necessarily need to know or care what backend storage is going there, even, even as a tenant admin, you know, because you may just be administrating for your particular um, department or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so in the cold migration state here, uh, I used the poll option, um, and that ticker goes gradually from zero to 100% as the migration completes. I do my Nova list, and you know, oh, that's weird. Uh, I have this verify resize status rather than just up, which is what you might expect uh, running this for the first time. Uh, so then from the command line, I'm just running that quick resize confirm. Uh, it is also available from the Horizon dashboard, so if the instance is in that verify resize state, there'll be an extra button or option there uh, to do that as well. So I'm going to move on now to live migration, uh, which is um, probably what I'm going to spend the vast majority of the rest of the time talking about, um, both in terms of the fact that it is, uh, I guess, one of, the, one of the ways of moving instances that people find more interesting, but also that because of what it's trying to do, it has uh, more complex uh, prerequisite requirements to actually get it working. Um, so live migration, uh, as I mentioned before, moves uh, the virtual machine from one host to another uh, without any uh, noticeable downtime. Uh, we'll get to what noticeable means in a moment. Um, but I, I say that to highlight the fact that there is technically actually a brief outage uh, as we're completing the copy. Uh, so there are two approaches to live migration supported both at the QMU slash libvirt layer, uh, but also via OpenStack Nova. Um, so there's using shared storage, um, and I include in that volume-based. Uh, so that means that either you're using uh, shared storage to back up the Nova instance or share the uh, Nova instances uh, path on each of your hypervisors uh, so that any individual hypervisor can access um, that's those same set of disk images. Um, or alternatively, if you're using boot from volume, then you effectively have shared storage in that case being supplied by Cinder. Um, we still obviously have the need uh, to sync uh, the memory state uh, while we're doing this, um, but we've obligated the need to copy across the disk uh, storage because that's already there. Um, the alter other alternative is using block migration, uh, which in previous or older versions of QMU was kind of a little bit shaky. Um, it has a completely new implementation in newer versions of QMU. Um, quite a few people use it. Um, and it does a direct transfer of not just the memory state but also the disks. Uh, so the trade-off you're making here is that um, it does take longer. You're transferring a lot more data uh, between the two nodes. Um, but on the flip side, some operators prefer this approach because either or, either or um, they, they don't use migration that often uh, and they don't want the overhead, uh, either performance or administration-wise, with running shared storage if they only need it for these occasional maintenance events. Um, so that's, that's kind of the trade-off that you're making there. Shared storage migration will typically be much quicker. Um, but it does have that extra overhead to actually have it set up and working. So in terms of how it works, um, kind of at a high level, um, so initially uh, the Nova scheduler selects a destination host. Uh, 
although again I should mention that uh, like some of the other commands you can actually override it by specifying a target host. Um, I should also mention why I'm saying that that uh, again here if you're using uh, block migration you actually have to specify that so the default is to try and do shared storage migration. Um, so the scheduler selects a destination host unless you specified one yourself in which case again it bypasses a scheduler. Um, Weirdly though, in this particular case, uh, and this is an oddity that's probably worth highlighting and will come up again uh, in the end when we talk about issues that we're still working on, um, there are additional checks done in the libvirt driver on both the source and destination host on uh, disk, RAM, CPU model, um, and also the mapped volumes uh, that may or may not be connected um, to the instance. Um, RAM in particular uh, causes some issues at the moment. Um, so for those familiar uh, with the concept of overcommitting memory, uh, by default, or in the default configuration, Nova overcommits memory uh, by 16 to 1. Uh, operators tend to change that uh, substantially, but regardless, a lot of people are using OpenStack with overcommit of some level enabled. Um, this calculation is happening on the compute node, and overcommit is a scheduler side uh, setting. Uh, so when we do this calculation on the compute node at the moment, we're not factoring in overcommit at all. So that means that Although by your overcommit calculations, the destination host should have enough space to take the instance, uh, it may actually fail anyway. Um, that's an issue we're currently working to resolve. Uh, the mapped volumes comes up um, because when we're using or when we have an instance at the moment uh, with kind of a mixed storage model, so where we've used an image to boot it and then we have attached volumes associated with it, um, the migration of those mapped volumes uh, will currently try and copy them over themselves. Also not good. Um, so that's again on the list of things uh, that we're trying to resolve that I'll get to, uh, particularly for the Mataka piece uh, of the discussion. So anyway, assuming that our source and destination host checked out, uh, we move into stage three, uh, which is what we call the iterative uh, pre-copy. Uh, so what this means is we start copying memory pages from the active virtual machine uh, to a new virtual machine um, that's in a paused state that we create on the destination. Um, obviously while we're doing that, um, our source virtual machine or the, the virtual machine on the source host is still running, still dirtying pages as it accesses memory. Uh, so while we're doing this, um, you know, we take one big block, copy it across, keep going, and then eventually when we get to the, what we think is the end, we take another look and we say, okay, we have more dirty pages, we keep copying, and gradually the idea is that the delta should get smaller and smaller uh, to the point where QMU calculates that, okay, given the transfer rates I'm getting, I'm going to be able to copy all of these remaining dirty pages in one step. Um, and that's when we pause the uh, source VM, copy that last step, um, typically in, in a matter of milliseconds, and then fire it up on the new host. Um, and then finally, uh, once that's worked, uh, we clean up the source. Um, in terms of uh, gotchas or how it doesn't work, I mean, I mentioned a couple of things where we went through there. One of the big things uh, that causes a lot of questions, uh, so I'm fairly uh, active on ask.openstack.org, for example, and there's kind of like two questions, two Nova questions that are just recurring, and this is one of them. Uh, the other one is, why did I get a no valid host error? Um, gets a lot of free karma points for answering those. Um, so in terms of the CPU mode or model compatibility, um, we have this idea in at least the Libvirt and KVM-based hypervisor uh, of exposing to the guests some virtual CPU which may or may not match what's on the physical box. Um, so the maximum performance we get is by exposing every single CPU feature that exists on the physical CPU die. Um, the downside, however, is that live migration is going to fail if on the source host and destination host we don't have that same exact set of uh, CPU features. And the problem here is that even within uh, certain named model ranges of CPUs, which you know, as a consumer of the, of the hardware, uh, you would expect to match exactly. Um, occasionally there are changes between them uh, which can cause this problem. Uh, so effectively what you have to make is a performance versus flexibility trade-off. Um, so you want to determine how much of that performance um, you want to trade off uh, for the ability of increasing uh, your effective live migration uh, domain or the uh, size of your li live migration cluster, so where you can live migrate to from any given host. So Nova provides or uh, exposes some configuration keys to influence this choice a little bit. Um, so the host pass-through option uh, is kind of what I talked about first. The idea of just exposing through every single feature that's available 
uh, for maximum performance, uh, but minimal ability to migrate, basically, or live migrate, I should specify, in particular. Uh, we have the idea of host model, uh, so where we can pick uh, from any one of a number of uh, host models that are already known to libvirt and QMU, predefined, um, so we can use one of those. And those kind of um, are best fit for the, sorry, uh, what I was referring to there is actually custom, so I'll go back a step. So host pass through is all the way through uh, all of the features. Host model is an approximation of the host CPU model. Um, so what I mean by that is it'll take a look at the, um, the physical features being exposed, compare it to the list QMU knows about, and do an approximation, uh, which is kind of generally re relevant to the lowest common denominator within that model. Um, and that allows you migration, at least if all of your um, CPUs in your cluster are based off, say, Sandy Bridge, um, then you can migrate between all of those. Um, now, where you can hit trouble, obviously, is where you have heterogeneous hardware, then maybe they're not. Maybe you have some Westmere, some Sandy Bridge, some something else, and you have to find some lowest common denominator for those if you want to migrate between all of them. Um, and that's where custom comes in. Uh, so this is where we have the ability um, to actually specify a specific uh, CPU model that we want to use. Um, so one, one of the uh, example questions where this came up was someone was trying to use a i386 box or i686 box and an xx664 in the same cluster. And to, to get that, you basically have to go down to like a Pentium 2. Uh, so that's probably a little bit of an outrageous example, but that's the kind of thing where you really have to trade off the performance if you want to migrate between these machines that are you know, pretty vastly different, different although I even if they're both you know, x86 architectures. Um, so to find out what models are available, uh, we can use Versh or QMU, KVM, uh, CPU help uh, just to get that list. And then at the bottom there, uh, we just drop that pretty much straight into our Nova config. Um, in terms of other ways to fail, um, I'm not going to go into great detail on these. Uh, so there have been a couple of good presentations, particularly in Vancouver, uh, covering a lot of the details about how to set things up to avoid these. Uh, specifically, so I have that linked on the reference slide at the end for people who want to dig into those uh, if they miss those. Um, but similar to CPU models, uh, we have a concept of machine types in QMU, uh, which effectively defines what hardware we're exposing to the guest. Um, the machine type in use has to be available both on the source and destination hypervisor. Um, typically, the distributor, uh, if you're getting packages from one, uh, will deal with that uh, for you. It mainly, mainly becomes an issue when we're trying to upgrade um, between distribution releases and need to migrate. Um, to do a rolling upgrade. Uh, inconsistent networking configuration, uh, so but the source and destination, destination hypervisor have to be able to talk to each other um, on the specified network. Um, in inconsistent clocks uh, can cause a lot of issues uh, with tr trying to sync this up as we go through. Um, VNC listening addresses, uh, so when we um, if we're too specific uh, in the way we're binding uh, VNC uh, on the source host, and it may not work when we move to the uh, destination host, and we may not actually be able to connect via VNC. Uh, and if we're doing uh, security uh, or a secure live migration, so using SSH tunneling, uh, we need to make sure that that's set up correctly and we've distributed keys correctly. Um, in terms of other operator issues, which are maybe a little bit uh, more OpenStack specific, so the list of issues on the previous slide is pretty general to if you're doing migration with Libvirt and KVM, those are things you need to be aware of as a deployer. Uh, but OpenStack specifically, um, so migrations um, can take too long or fail to complete. Um, so if we think about um, what we talked about before, we're basically at the whim of how big the virtual machine is and how act active it is in terms of whether we're going to be able to migrate or not. Uh, if we can't keep up uh, in terms of network foot throughput uh, and we're not doing some tuning around the edge uh, to try and compensate for that, um, then we're not going to get anywhere. Uh, until very recently, Nova wasn't doing any of that tuning. Uh, so I'll talk about that uh, some more in a moment. Uh, we also need to use um, Versh, um, bypassing Nova to do a lot of things. Uh, so you can't, for example, via the Nova API, um, throttle migrations, cancel migrations, uh, monitor how they're going, uh, so there's very little to no feedback. Um, tune the migration max downtime. Uh, so what that means is the finalization step I talked about, uh, where we pause uh, the source VM um, to copy those final few dirty pages across and restart on the new host. Um, 
the, there's a value associated with that called the max downtime. And that's what QMU is evaluating against when it makes that calculation of can I finish the migration. So it's looking, can I finish the migration in this time? Um, if you have a particularly large virtual machine, you may want to extend that time a little to give you a higher chance of actually finalizing the migration. Uh, so Nova hasn't been tuning that up until this point. Um, so that's something we've been missing out on. Um, there are certain instance configurations that can't be migrated at the moment. Um, so mixed storage is probably the most glaring one, uh, which I touched on before. Um, so if you're mixing uh, image and volume-based storage, if you have a config drive attached, uh, all of these things are currently not going to live migrate. Um, that's something we have to work on. Um, and also the use of pass-through devices. So this is less likely to go away anytime soon, but if you're using uh, physical SROV cards, uh, GPU pass-through, anything like that, um, then at the moment there's no live migration available to that as either. Um, there are some things we can potentially do in the future with SROV, um, particularly if you're using a Mac VTAP device, uh, but there's a performance trade-off with that as well. So in general, we can probably assume that uh, for pass-through devices, live migration is going to be not in the question anytime soon. Uh, I mentioned live migration doesn't correctly account for overcommit, uh, so that's also an issue for operators currently. Uh, effectively, you know, if they're doing a lot of migration, it, it really impacts them in terms of the memory utilization of their cluster. Um, and then also I mentioned the tenant admin uh, currently needs to know if shared or block storage is available. So what have we done about that uh, in terms of the Liberty release? Um, so long-running li live migrations. Uh, so I mentioned the factors involved here are the amount of guest RAM, the speed with which that guest RAM is being used or dirtied, and the speed of the migration network. Um, so we were using uh, a fixed maximum downtime with QMU. Um, as of Liberty, uh, we have the ability uh, to scale up the downtime uh, to allow a better chance of uh, completing um, live migration. Uh, we also have a limit on the number of outbound live migrations that are going at once. Uh, so if you think about if I have a host and I have, say, three live migrations all going outbound at the same time, uh, they're all using, you know, approximating a little bit, you know, 33% of the network traffic, give or take. Um, theoretically, um, by doing that, I'm limiting the chance or decreasing the chance that any one of those three is going to finish because they're all getting less network traffic than they would if I did one at a time. Uh, so that's what we're getting at there. Um, kind of, it was related work, um, which you know, is indirectly related to migrations. Uh, we're also now limiting the number of inbound build requests uh, that a single host will try and take on. Um, so the default for that is a little bit higher. Uh, I'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, and also, um, you know, just talking about all these changes when combined, uh, the idea is that we're maximizing the chance that that finalization step will actually finish, uh, particularly for large VMs. Uh, we also have a lot of new configuration keys to influence this behavior um, because it can depend a lot, um, you know, on how much throughput you're getting on your host, what type of network cards you're using and so on, um, and how frequently you're using live migration for that matter, um, how you want these things to work. Uh, so in terms of the scaling steps, uh, so we have the live migration downtime. Uh, so that is that maximum length of time for the finalization step. Um, and that's effectively saying what's the maximum amount of time that the VM can be paused to complete migration on the source. Um, the number of live migration downtime steps. Uh, so we take incremental steps to reach that value. So we don't initially set the downtime to uh, the maximum allowable. We try and start optimistically and then gradually work back to that more pessimistic value, uh, which is obviously going to be longer. Uh, finally, uh, the live migration downtime delay, uh, so the time to wait before we increment through those steps. Um, and all three of those work in unison to handle the way we scale that downtime value. And I'll walk through an example in a moment because the way those combine is kind of a little bit non-obvious um, to explain. Um, in terms of timeouts, uh, so we also have some overall totals. So these are kind of outside of the scaling um, process, but how long can I allow a live migration to go um, before I assume it's not going to finish? Um, so we now have a value to set that timeout value. Uh, it is scaled by the, the amount of guest RAM, um, just the number of gigabytes. Um, so if I set live migration completion timeout um, to 800, for example, which is the default, um, that's actually multiplied by the amount of guest RAM to get to the value that's actually going to be used. Um, in terms of live migration progr progress um, and the timeout there, uh, so what we're saying is if we don't see um, 
progress in terms of the data being copied um, for a certain amount of time, a default 150 seconds, um, then at that point, we again, we assume live migration has failed catastrophically uh, and we try and clean up. Uh, in terms of concurrent operations, uh, so I mentioned we can control the number of max concurrent live migrations. Uh, we default to one, uh, which is pretty pessimistic, um, but it, you know, it's recommended that if operators want to run concurrent live migrations, then they test that first uh, before they increase that. Uh, and max concurrent builds and new instances being built on a single, single hypervisor uh, with a default of 10. So in terms of the stepping example, um, so here I'm using a 400 millisecond max. Uh, so again, that's that maximum amount of time for the completion step where the VM on the source is paused. Um, 10 steps, a 30 second delay between each step, uh, and a three gigabyte guest. Um, so first of all, the delay between the steps uh, is set to 30 uh, by the number of gigabytes of RAM, in this case three. Uh, so you can see that I go from zero to 90 to 180 uh, my increments. Um, and we scale exponentially across those steps until we hit 400. So you can see I start off with 37 milliseconds, 38 milliseconds, uh, and then gradually uh, we go up all the way uh, to 400 milliseconds. And it's a little bit hard to read um, on the chart here, but the blue line um, going up on the diagonal is the delay, uh, and the red line um, towards the bottom is the max downtime as we go up and try and give that guest a chance to finalize. Um, so what we're effectively saying is that um, at the end of the day, if the guest can't be fi or the transfer can't be finalized in 400 milliseconds, then it's going to fail, um, and we fail out the migration when that happens. Uh, but we're giving those larger guests the best opportunity we can to actually finish the live migration. Uh, one other addition in Liberty, uh, which is relevant more uh, to evacuate than live migrate, uh, so we have the ability in Liberty um, to report uh, from external tools into Nova uh, that a host is down. Um, so the reason we might want to do that is that, as I alluded to when discussing evacuate, um, Nova is not going to immediately notice that a host has gone down. Um, it does it via a series of periodic tasks, which means you can, depending on how you set things up, um, you know, host, host failure detection can be kind of one to two minutes um, for Nova to pick that up in the database. Uh, we have external tools like Pacemaker, uh, which are much faster at picking these things up um, and have existed for a long time for that matter. Um, so there's now the ability for those to call into Nova and say, hey, this host is down, which means Nova then puts it in the down status, um, and then we can immediately initiate and evacuate at that point rather than having to wait that extra piece of time. Uh, in terms of Mataka uh, and beyond for that matter, uh, so that discussion is kind of obviously going on this week, um, but going into uh, the summit, um, there's a group of people in the Nova community coalescing um, together to work on live migration um, and there are issues related to that. And there's an etherpad associated with that. And I think in the session after this, uh, we're going to be discussing this potentially in the unconference session. Um, but in the short term, uh, so CI coverage. Um, so it's only been fairly recently that we've had a, uh, a, a job uh, somewhere in the OpenStack infra um, that can do multiple hosts, uh, which is obviously a prerequisite to being able to test uh, in the CI infrastructure um, doing a live migration or any kind of migration between those. Um, so in terms of CI coverage, uh, the goal is to get that job voting, uh, but also to expand the test coverage to ensure that um, not just the basic paths are being covered, but also things like boot from volume, et cetera. Uh, so we have full coverage. Uh, to agree on and improve the API documentation. Uh, so one of the big problems in this area and one of the reasons um, that I wanted to talk about the differences between um, evacuate, migrate, and live migrate uh, from an API perspective in the first place uh, is that there is very little documentation on what those differences are uh, available outside of the code base, basically. Um, so f within the development community, there's a desire to agree on what these are uh, and improve the documentation of what currently is uh, before we try and move to what we might want to do in the future. Um, support for migrating instances with mixed storage, and in particular, I think the config drive case is the big one that we really want to get uh, fixed as soon as possible. Um, so that you can have an instance with a config drive attached and actually migrate it, and then eventually have an instance that has volumes associated uh, do the same. Uh, support for pausing uh, and potentially canceling migrations. migrations. Uh, pausing in particular uh, is a very helpful one if we can implement it. Uh, the reason for that is it gives the admin uh, the opportunity to effectively stop the guest dirtying pages. And if based on our discussion, uh, about how live migration works, if they pause, then obviously it makes that finalization step 
you know, much easier to complete. You're no longer constantly um, putting yourself behind. So if you have a really big VM and it's taking a really long time to migrate, uh, it gives the admin the option of pausing that VM to make sure they actually get it where they want it to go. Uh, better resource tracking in this area uh, in general um, is, is needed. Uh, so we have a number of kind of edgy and race, race type conditions that can cause a long-running long live migration to fail for various reasons. Um, using libvirt storage pools um, instead of SSH for the migrate or resize case. Um, so that's an enabler um, for migrating suspended instances in particular. Um, so at the moment, uh, if you have a suspended instance, you can't actually migrate it. You have to bring it up and then migrate it, which is a little bit strange because from a theoretical perspective, it should actually be easier to migrate it while it's suspended, but anyway. Um, and it, as I mentioned, correcting the memory uh, over commit situations, the way that's tested uh, when we're doing the source and, ho uh, source and destination uh, will a migration work check. Um, Medium to long term, uh, things like uh, not just using uh, the current tunneling system uh, for securing live migration, but also doing TLS uh, encryption. Uh, so there's work underway in QMU around that, which is obviously um, a gating factor for this to actually be done. Um, auto convergence. Um, so this is semi related to some of the concepts we talked about, but there's also um, this way through auto convergence to adjust uh, effectively the amount of CPU the guest is getting. Uh, so not having to do a complete pause, but just effectively giving it less cycles um, to slow the speed with which it can dirty pages and therefore, again, make that finalization step easier to complete. Um, and finally, uh, post-copy migration. Uh, so the idea of actually kind of flipping the way we do live migration on its head um, and instead of um, putting, the, putting the destination instance on a host and putting it in pause state, actually bringing it up straight away and then copying the memory across as it's accessed. Uh, which is a little bit of an inception type idea, but uh, something that's being looked at as well. Um, so at that point, um, I'm pretty much done. Uh, so um, I can take questions, but just in terms of some uh, general information stuff, so the slides I've already uploaded on SlideShare, um, I believe, um, informed, you can uh, submit anonymized feedback uh, or abuse uh, using the Summit app. Um, and for pictures of cats or stuff on their head, et cetera, I think you still have to use Twitter and email. Uh, so those are there as well. Uh, for people who want to get involved, uh, there is that etherpad there uh, at the bottom. Uh, and in terms of references, I mentioned that there have been a couple other talks in this area. Um, there's a long list of uh, bugs in a, a, a Google Docs spreadsheet, et cetera. Uh, so there is a references slide uh, that is going to be on the slide share page as well uh, if you head there. Uh, so that's all available. Uh, so questions? Um, yes, okay. basically. Any thought of changing that for people who don't care about the well, encryption on I think uh, one of the things that's actually been discussed at the moment on the mailing list as more and more developers realize that, themselves realize that evacuate and migrate are different things, is actually trying to at least condense this client side of all of this, if not the um, API side, and make like a generic move API. Um, because the user shouldn't necessarily care. I think for the most part, I don't see the SSH requirement going away um, because for most real, ca real use cases, people actually want some kind of encryption over it. Taking that as a no. <laughs> um, so you mean the source VM? Um, not many, effectively. Um, so it will, in, in the cases where the VM is still up, so a live migration, um, it should stay there. Um, 
where it gets complicated is primarily the migrate case, I think, where you can end up, and I, I actually did this in my testing with like half the VM on one host and half on the other, and that's not a good place. Um, but I think live migration, you know, if we find instances where you uh, try and live migrate, it fails, and you can't get back to the original instance, I think we treat those as bugs. But uh, migrate is the weird one. Does that make sense? Previous experience has seen uh, the networking causing issues. You know, the, so we can't recover the tap on the source one. Mm -hmm. Or now I don't. I haven't tried it. Okay. So most of my failures that I've seen were exactly in that pattern. The, the it would create an instance on the destination. Something would time out or whatever reason it felt that it should fail it, but it will never get back the network tap on the source. Yeah. Yeah, and in, in theory, the network part is supposed to be one of the last parts we do for that reason. Um, but still, because of some of the other foibles in this area of the code base, it wouldn't surprise me if there's race conditions in there that need to be fixed. So, yeah. Hey, uh, you mentioned that um, evacuate and call migrate effectively use like the resize methods on the well, driver. It's a little bit special because Migrate does use the resize API. Um, evacuate uses rebuild, I believe, which is different again, uh, just to confuse people. <laughs> so, uh, I guess uh, maybe that sounds my question. I was going to ask you if there, um, does that mean you get it for free if, like, if from the point of view of the, if the node, if your node driver implements uh, resize, uh, is there a lot of extra work to be done to uh, actually be able to support uh, uh, like the call migrate? Yeah, so if you look at the um, hypervisor support matrix, uh, which I originally had a slide in there on this and I actually pulled it because it wasn't particularly useful in a lot of cases. And one of the reasons for that is that migrate is not actually treated as a separate call on that chart. Uh, so when you look at that chart, you actually want to look at resize um, because if resize is there as supported for a given hypervisor, um, then effectively migrate should work as well. It is actually the same code path. It's like the, the migrate um, bit in the API is like a really thin shim, which is basically just passing the parameters straight through to the resize call. Yeah. If you configure to resize on the same host, does, yes. does migrate then stop working? Yes. <laughs> so the, the thing I'll say about that is that typically we don't recommend turning allow resize on the same host on in the first place. It's primarily there for people who are doing like a single host test install just to try it out. Um, so that's the reason I don't think people are too concerned about that. But yeah, um, that was, I think, one of the asterisks on that slide. Um, is commented like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we see it as a, yeah. Um. So, you've got, so you've got ephemeral disk and volume on shared storage. Live migration won't work. Is that what it Yes. Yes. And it'll overwrite the volume. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a check in there. Um, that uh, map volumes check I mentioned in the, um, when it's checking the source and destination host, kind of check migrate will work. Uh, there is something in there to catch, like if there's a, mix, a mixture of volumes associated, it won't let you do the live migrate, it'll just fail out of the API call. Um, because previously it would, yeah, really mess that up. But <laughs> um, I was looking at trunk today when I was double checking that, so that's not a good sign. Um, but I think it's been there for a little while because th these issues in that etherpad have been percolating for a while. Um, so people have already been uh, fixing some of those things. Um, any other? Yep. I was asking about so the fact that the uh, migration is based on this resize and, and rebuild stuff. Am I correct that there's no plan to get rid of that? Um, there's, a disc there's actually, so I didn't have this in the slides because I like with, with the Mataka and Beyond stuff, obviously I'm just forecasting based on what's being discussed. So there is a discussion thread that originally kicked off on OpenStack Dev uh, talking about the idea of having a migration state machine, um, but it actually went a little bit elsewhere, um, which was this, this, there's a fair bit of agreement that the way migrate in particular works at the moment is kind of dumb. Like uh, particularly like having a confirm step where there's nothing you can really confirm. Either it worked or it didn't. Um, so I don't know, there's not an agreed upon plan for how to deal with that. 
uh, from an API or even a client perspective. There, are, you know, some there was some suggestions on the thread, like I mentioned, of having a move API which calls evacuate or migrate depending on the state of the host, um, and potentially reworking the migrate call uh, to be a little bit more specific to migrate instead of just being a pass through. Um, but I wouldn't say there's agreement around those things. There's just agreement that there's a problem. <laughs> um, it, I would say I, I expect that to go somewhere just based on you know the people involved, the amount of discussion that's going on about it in various forms, but it may take a while, that's all. And similar question, uh, the new OpenStack client, I don't think it has or it has similarly confusing yeah, so I, I haven't looked much at it outside of Keystone uh, in terms of the verbs they're using at the moment. Um, that doesn't surprise me. I, I know they've tried to do a, a, a tr they've tried to do a little bit of abstraction to try and make those things nicer and not necessarily bind themselves to how it is in the API or how it is in the original client is how we have to have it there. But I can imagine that. Yeah. Um, in preparing for this, I primarily stuck to the Nova client, um, and obviously the Nova developers at the moment, that's what they're still largely focused on. Um, I, I would say that while there's been a big push in, say, the Keystone community to move to the OpenStack client, there hasn't, that hasn't really happened in many of the other projects, including Nova. Um, so that, in particular, may be a ways away. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks everyone for coming.